live. Hey, everybody. Today I'm joined by Matthew Enderley from Patch Rays, and we have DJ Anderson from Digitizing Masterclass. And of course, I'm Jeff Fuller from, well, this room right here. Um, <laughs> so today we have an exciting announcement because um, last week was full of all, all sorts of announcements. We announced that uh, Justin Armenta and DJ Anderson, who's with us today, um, joined the LLC. We're excited to have those guys in. He's going to nod his head and agree. Yes, I'm very excited. <laughs> um, and we're going to follow that up with, well, today, actually, before I go too far, we're going to be talking about pricing. We're going to have a healthy debate on how much I charge and whether or not I should charge more. Um, yes, charge and it more. Should be, it should be a fun debate. And to do that, we would like to introduce and announce our two new moderators that we have for the Embroidery Nerd Group. We have Miss... Ramona McKee from Quick to Stitch and Saturday's show, Copy in a Conversation. Thank you. Hello. And I'm waiting for the other guy to look at his webcam. <laughs> <laughs> we have Mr. Mike Muldowney from Canada. Right? The nerd to the north. It's Canada. It's Canada. Yeah. Mike's Northern, like Northern Mexico. <laughs> Mexico North. Mexico North. Yeah. He, ha he has a map in front of him that's like, you're from here, if Jeff asks. I have here. to remind myself all the time. Yeah. I mean, there's the, the background says it all. If you guys can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got to right. So, since we're going ahead and announcing this, and we are really excited... Uh, Mike, why don't you give everybody a quick bio? Uh, of me? Yeah, not of well, me. Right. I mean, you could do me. <laughs> uh, my name is Mike Waldowney. I'm uh, with Tequila Inks and Threads up here in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, uh, that's in Canada. We have we have lovely white sand. Um, we've been doing garment decoration around here for I think we're into our fifth year now. Um, I don't know, we got just under 40 heads, uh, two people, so they're not all stitching at the same time, but uh, we can throw pretty much anything on anything, and uh, and that's where we've been going at that. Found the Embroidery Nerd Group through uh, Eric's uh, uh, take up. Take up. Um, I think it was almost, a, what are we going on, two years ago now? Something like that? Something like that. And uh, been annoying the hell out of these guys ever since with uh, sound logic and good ideas. There you go. And I do have to comment that I do like this the sippy, the reciprocator logo oh, yeah. on your hat. I noticed that. Yeah, it's my sippy cap. <laughs> Not to be outdone by Letty's sippy cup. Well, I emptied my sippy cup, so... <laughs> Oh, I love Tim Hortons. It's empty. So, <laughs> all right. So, Hold Ramona, on. now we're gonna pick on you. Well, don't don't get too picky here. Um, Ramona McKee, Mrs. McKee, actually, at least you know for now. Um, so, anyways, I've been digitizing, uh, digitizing for over nine years now. Um, I've used three different primary, primarily three different softwares. I'm learning two more. Um, I have coffee, coffee and conversation. We do that on Saturday mornings. Try to just have some conversation, just share some ideas, um, talk about things regarding, uh, running your business, running your machines, um, running your embroidery. Um, actually been invited to teach a class next year. I'll be teaching a class um, digitizing trends at the Everything Embroidery Mart in March. I hope to see some of you there. Very cool. Um, let's see. Oh, and the, the nerds. Yeah, they're a great bunch of guys, aren't they? I'm, um, I've learned a lot from them. I'd like to say I've uh, contributed to their group some. To the point where 
you know, they invited me to be a monitor. Now I just got to figure out exactly what that means. So that's about it, guys. Go back. Basically, it means put, put deep people in timeout. <laughs> oh, timeout. Is there like a room for that? Is there like a, uh, like in hockey, they have the penalty box? It's called the ban hammer. <laughs> if you're in the Discord, there's an, even an emoji for it. Yep. Ooh. That one got us kicked out of a couple of groups. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got you banned. I got banned for a different reason. Fair but, enough. Yeah. Is, is, is Sound logic like and good ideas. It's not welcome everywhere. Who right. knew you couldn't post the user manual to a piece of software in that software's group? Because it says no sharing links. I guess the user manual link is a link. So oh. they got me. Yeah, they, they got you there. <laughs> hey, Jeff, is that is that Adam next to you? Right there, yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Adam. He's working in Floriani on something. Smart kid. Smart kid. I, I'm willing to bet he's trying to crash it. I'm not <laughs> trying to. He's not doing very good because it runs perfectly. Now, we found out when you try to save to a network location, that can cause issues. Mm -hmm. So now it's we're saving everything locally and pushing it to the network. Dropbox is life. That yep. handles all that stuff. That's pretty much where we're at. So I'm going to try and catch some of the comments. Uh, wow, there's a lot of comments. All right, so I'm going to start from the beginning. We have Cindy King joining us. Hello. We have Mary from Northeast Ohio, and she just says Sassy Nation. So there you go. We have Jesse, who commented on every one of our YouTube videos, right, Matt? Yep. Every, every one of them for the past over two years. So Matt sent her a box. And, okay, that's further down. Matt, I got my package. Thanks. So, so the box got there. We have Jody Stock. Hello. Kingsbury's Crafts. Uh, Jody's in Oregon. And we have Kathy from Chicago. Oh, Keep going Kathy and I are through. neighbors. Ooh, that's fun. My closest neighbor is Matt, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> we have Laura joining us from Michigan. Uh, Frank Dunn from across the pond joining us as well. Um, there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, Jesse says hi, Moldo. Um, we have Patricia from so Southern PA. Uh, Bridgie, Bridget from Long Island, and I probably pronounced that wrong, so fire me. Um, we want yep. to do that. Watching from Haymaker, Virginia, welcome and thank you. Uh, we have Pam watching from Australia, awesome. Wow. Um, Nikki says, I will be there to the EEM market, uh, she'll be teaching there as well, and we have wow this is going uh we have andrea here from love stitches saying hello jesse says hi adam i loved her hi, thread jesse. wall did you notice the wall of thread behind her oh on the comment this one? Oh. oh wow that is nice look at that okay we're all coming to your house I That's more organized than the store I go to. We have Penny from North Carolina and Frank saying congratulations, Mike and Ramona. Wow. And there's a few more of those. They're up there uh, in the comments. And Cindy says, will this be at 6 o'clock p.m. for the winter? I do believe so. Um, it's actually Justin that sets these up. And Justin, he gets home from work. And come straight here. So for him, they don't celebrate uh, daylight savings time. So we work a little bit more around his schedule because his life never changes because it's always at the same time. I've never, ever in my life heard anybody say celebrate daylight savings time. Yeah, I was going to say that too. It's definitely that, was, not a that was a weird choice of words, man. Yeah. That's <laughs> what they call it in Iowa. They say we celebrate daylight savings time. I think they're trying to brainwash us yes. into thinking that we Make couldn't get up going. an hour earlier. Propaganda. <laughs> what did he say? He said propaganda. 
<laughs> yes, he's eleven. This is going. This is going great. Um. So we have Chuck joining us. It says a Facebook user, but Nikki says hi, Chuck. So I'm guessing that she can see it from her side. So we'll just go with that. That is Chuck. Uh, and we're gonna talk about pricing. Oh, and I can see everybody people really in here. Good. Look at all these people. This is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, there we're, are we're missing Justin now. Yeah, they, we're just gonna... they came to see Mike and Ramona. Thank yeah. you. Oh, okay, and uh, I think that means the other of us can leave, and we can leave it up to them to run the show, right? I think they'd do um, great. Oh, we're gonna run we, your LLC Mike, right into the ground. Mike, we can handle this. Okay, we the we the boss now. We I like that we the boss. For the next oh, forty three seconds, all embroidery nerd <laughs> products are fifty percent off. And we got here just in time. <laughs> there you go. Maybe we were a little slow. Um, coupon code, not real discount. Coupon code, not real <laughs> Oh, boy. All right. So we're going to talk about pricing. And I think probably the easiest way that we can uh, discuss that is I, I'm sure we all have our own different pricing structures and how we calculate that. So we'll start with Matt because he's in the upper left-hand corner. Oh, and Matt, so, uh, am I supposed to talk about my super overly complicated patch quoting <laughs> spreadsheet? Yes. How do you come up with your pricing? Uh, so in a nutshell, basically what I do is I add up every single component that goes into making a patch. And then I calculate how much material one patch or that entire order is going to cost or use of it. And then I take that and then I add my desired profit on top of it. And that's pretty much it. So mm -hmm. I, I started out looking at like the pricing from like companies overseas who are doing, you know, 50 patches for like $2 each. And it's like, okay, well, I got to be close to that. Yeah, then you just don't make anything. Um, I found my customer base are willing to pay a, a bit more than that. So I can usually get it from like no less than $8 a patch for even on orders of like 50 plus, which is, it's fine for me because I don't have overhead. That's another big thing too. I have eight heads that I run patches on. I don't have rent. I don't have any bills really to pay. So that's kind of the other thing. Ramona has notes. I I want to I want to argue that point with you, Matt, about not having overhead. You do have overhead. It you're taking space out of your home that you cannot use for personal use. You're using the utilities of the house. I think for your bookkeeping purposes, at the very least, you should at least be paying rent to yourself based on the amount of square footage you use. Yeah, I was going to do that. And then I realized that that's takes, you know, more <laughs> Yeah. And then a uh, patch phrase doesn't make as much money. And then I feel bad. And then I spend it on stupid things anyways. So I just keep it in the company. I'm not a tax accountant. But to the IRS, I do pay my taxes 100% accurately. To any government agents watching at this <laughs> moment, I am completely caught up on all of my taxes. And in fact, I'm actually paying more just for the fun of it. Yeah, right. Don't audit me. <laughs> audit. Well, I guess we're just going to move on down the line here. And Justin, you're next. How do you guys, what do you guys base off your pricing off of when in your Hi, show? by the way. <laughs> Hi, Justin. Hi, guys. Sorry, sorry I'm late. Um, Throwing you into the cooker here. I think, I think I'm a little bit different scenario as far as um, being in a, a larger multi-head machine shop. Um, it's, I kind of, I, I walked into my position in, into established company that was already going, so I. I kind of came in and because I had experience from an, from another company as far as uh, managing production, I kind of came in and, and based it on what they're charging already, 
And not only are they are they retail, but they also do wholesale as well as far as wholesale decorating, embroidery, and screen printing. So those are two different worlds. Um, but a, a lot of it is based on as, as far as making that, breaking down the, the cost to run the business, you know, there's payroll, there's the electricity, there's the, you know, the machines and, and everything. Uh, it's a pretty big shop. I'm not sure exactly how many square footage, but um, yeah, it's all broken down and, and, and you, you go from there as far as what your break even point and how much you want to make per hour past your, past your, um, your, your costs, your hard costs. So um, that's where we, we kind of went as far as, you know, of course, retail, you have a little bit more uh, room to make, not only make more money, but you have a little bit of wiggle room to maybe give discounts for larger orders. Um, when it comes to wholesale, it's you're, you're pretty much breaking just at the amount that you that you want to make without losing money. Um, so it's kind of cut and dry when it comes to, to wholesale stuff. They they get their garments embroidered and that's it. You know, there's there's not any extras that you might throw in uh, that you would with retail people. You're muted, Jeff. <laughs> Perfect. I muted because I was clicking on things you could hear. So this is actually a good question, and I'll hit you both with it, uh, Matt and Justin. So, Matt, do you factor in future equipment purchases in pricing? <laughs> what is future equipment purchases? There's equipment your answer. Justin, do you factor that in? <clears throat> to tell you the truth, when it comes to that level of, of deciding pricing and whatnot, I don't have that much hand in – and looking at the figures, that would be the owner of the company. Um, I, I'm kind of tasked to to make sure that everything's running properly and smoothly and without mistakes and whatnot. So I'm not cutting into their profit. Uh, but yeah, it's the the main the main pricing as far as that's concerned is is done by the by the owner of the company. Um, All right. Well, we can push on down the line. Mike Muldowney's next. How did I was fourth? What happened? So he got, got moved. Jeff, uh, keep, Jeff keeps pushing himself further down the line. Just playing, noticed. just playing a game of shell game. <laughs> See, yeah, I know what you're talking about. He's moving around a series of cups. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Um, so we we came we came about our pricing structure backwards. Um, we started with perceived value of a piece. It didn't matter if it was a finished cap or a patch or or a jacket back or whatever. They, there's there's how much money kind of feels right for this. Um, five years ago when we got started, we were you know we were putting out lots of hats for you know twelve thirteen bucks, but you can't do that today. Um, but we. We started, we started with that, that perceived value and worked backwards uh, to a stitch-based a stitch based, a stitch based uh, a thing. You know, sti uh, quantity of stitches, quantity of items. Uh, we've got a, got a matrix that evolved over time. Um, and, uh, but it, nobody's really argued with it, which means I'm either leaving too much on the table or or people are just that happy with our stuff. Um, a little from got, column A, a little from column B. Yeah, most likely. You know, if both parties walk away thinking they got bent over, then you're in the right spot. So <laughs> <laughs> when when things started getting different is when I really started diving into patches. And, you know, just like Matt, I kind of compared to what I could find online. And, of course, I'm not going to compete with China. And I, I realized really quickly that I shouldn't try because there is there's a lot of value in something that's just made uh, in a location that doesn't have to travel by boat to get somewhere. Um, so customers are willing to pay more for something that's produced on this continent and, and maybe only has to take a truck or, or, or a plane. Um, but then I started getting into some government stuff and that went really weird. So I had to take another step back and go, go at it more from an approach like Matt did with, uh, with, uh, just adding up every single little cost 
and uh, and going with a multiplier from there. Still with a little bit of the perceived value factor because the last one I was doing was these was these puffy patches that I was showing off a while back. Stitch count doesn't matter because there's so much labor involved in the rest of the construction of the patch that the the time it spends on the embroidery machine just just doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter if you got one head or a hundred heads. And you know, to that note, nobody cares whether I'm in my basement in a commercial shop, whether I've got one head, ten heads, um, whether I'm getting my stuff wholesale, retail, they don't care. So that's why that's why we tried to base our base our pricing on what are people willing to pay for this? Not so much what does it cost me. When we got into the government stuff, uh, that changed because they're just looking pure and simple at cost. But uh, for our for our retail level level stuff, <clears throat> it it all came down to what are people willing to pay. Okay. Well, if we keep going down the line, DJ's up next. <laughs> I unmuted myself. Hey, um, well, you know it's such an it's such an interesting topic because it can it really depends a lot on what you do for business like and there are so many different ways to calculate it and one of the biggest factors is how many machines you have because you can only produce so much per hour right so the more heads you have the more you can produce per hour and so if you have a single head you're you're going to need to charge more than somebody that has 12, 24, 48, whatever, because you've got to make a certain amount of money per hour. And the thing is you only make money when the needle's going up and down. And that's what a lot of people don't factor in is that, you know, you can make some from the digitizing, but the majority of the money's made when the needle's going up and down. And on that note, one of the other things that that I just really get frustrated with pricing systems is they don't a lot of them are based off stitch count. Right. But they don't factor in things like trims and like how many trims are in a design, how many color changes are in a design. A lot of people don't realize that the majority of the time it can take so much more time if you have to trim a lot or change colors a lot. It takes more time than you think to execute a trim or a color change. And so those are also things that I feel like should be factored in um, because you have to know how much money and the way I look at it is you have to know how much money you need to make per hour on that machine or for all of your machines. And so if you can figure that out, um, you know, I like the calculators that take into account stitch count and trims and color changes and account for that time. Um, so it's when I got started in the industry, I had to go base all my pricing off of um, contract work because I just kind of did all of the work for one company and I had to take it over. So I had to like kind of match the prices of what they were getting and but one of the things that I learned over the really over the last few years is, you know, a lot of people are scared to charge more than other people, but you can get away with that if you know how to sell the difference. And that's a whole nother part of it is what can you do to differentiate yourself from the competition? And if you learn little tricks, little finishing tricks, stabilizer trip, you know, all sorts of different things. You can then tell them, well, these are the things that I do. And it justifies that additional cost because a lot of people that are just doing it off of the price alone are cutting corners. A lot of times, you know, they're trying to minimize um, their, their amount of cost, especially if they're a larger company. And so the more things that you can do to kind of differentiate, yourself and do stuff a little bit above and beyond what the average person would do they'll they'll pay that additional cost 
when they see the result. All right. Well, Ramona, you're next in line. Yeah, I saw that, Jeff. I saw that. And then me. <laughs> and then Matt. So my pricing structure, my pricing structure is based on, because, you know, the, the majority of what I do is digitizing. And I use a flat fee structure for that, regardless of the stitch count, regardless of the color changes. But when I do production, I take into account all of my expenses, which I already, you know, I've already calculated. I calculate this out once a year, at the beginning of the year. This is this is my square footage of the space I use. This is the the um, the expenses I have for the the house and a percentage of that goes towards the business. Um, my expectations for supply orders, I have a budget for that. Um, everything that goes into production, I have a number for. And I know how much I wanna make per hour. So I know what I need to cover for my overhead. I know what I need to cover for my machine expenses. And I know how much I need to cover for me. So with that, I have broken it down to a per quarter hour fee. I And because I'm doing the digitizing, when I do the stitch out, I know how long that stitch out is going to take with or without trims because I always, you know, I have a buffer. Um, but I have a per quarter hour fee. And if the stitch out is going to take 23 minutes, they get charged two 15 minute segments. If it's going to take 55 minutes, they get charged for 15 minute segments. That gives me a buffer for any of the cleanup work, any of the delays with trims, any machine issues. Um, and if I, and on the other side of this, if in my work, because I always make a couple of extra patches just in case, um, if those patches come out okay, I don't need them, so I send them with the customer. So even though I have, you know, I have a little bit of an upcharge, you know, my 15 minutes, um, they'll get the extras that come with that. Okay. Now, there was a question over here about um, putting money aside for future machine expenses or future machine uh, purchases. I put into a separate account, and this is regardless of, of production or digitizing, I put aside, and this is just a set dollars, $5 per, into a set aside account, just in case I run over on my books or need to buy something um, spur of the moment, or I want to make a machine purchase. Um, I've got that. I've got that account that I can pull out of if I need to. Oh, okay. and I don't. I don't buy a piece of equipment that I can't either pay for right away, or within um, a set period of time based on my current monthly income. So that's how I handle it. Well, since Matt's next down, no, I'm just kidding. I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm kind of somewhere in, in between everybody else. I basically took my expenses. Yep. Now I'm big. I basically took my expenses and I averaged them out. So, you know, I, I, I looked at a year and I averaged out how much I spend per month in a year. And that gave me my total cost. And then I added my profit into that, that I, and my, um, a salary, the profit and salary per hour. So I broke those costs down to how much per productive hour. So that's something that I haven't heard anybody else say yet, but I base my costs off of productive hours, which are time, the time that the needle's down and the machine's running versus me doing admin work where I'm sending emails and that kind of stuff. So I base it off of the productive hours and then I add my profit onto that and I add my hourly pay on that. And the productors, the productive hours have to pay for the whole day. Whether, you know, I could be like seven hours doing this and one hour doing that. It's still got to, the productive hours still have to pay for that. So I take that. And then when I look at my designs, I actually pull them up. I look at the amount of color changes. 
I look at the amount of trims and I calculate a total runtime based off of the garment and how fast I'm going to run my machine. Um, I run my machines at 800 stitches per minute unless it's a hat, then I drop it down. So for hats, I base off of 600 a minute. Um, flats, I base off of 800 a minute. And, you know, I look at if it's five colors, 10 colors. I look to see if I have the colors in stock. Um, if I don't have the colors in stock, I charge a dollar a spool to color match. Um, just because I, I have a customer that has avocado green in their logo. That's the only customer I use that color for. Nobody else wants it. So I add that dollar in there for when that happens. Um, but it seems like going across the board for everybody here, it's all based off of costs and time. Right. I have a question for you, Jeff. Mm hmm you said that, that your fees are based on your production hours? Productive hours, yes. Productive hours. Thank you. Um, who pays for your admin hours? You the productive have to hours. work. Right. The productive hours pay for the admin hours. Okay. So the productive hours, the times I'm producing and getting garments out, that has to pay for the time I admin. Okay. Hey, I want to like ask Jeff... Um, you know, you brought up a good point about like charging for the colors. One of the things that I found when I got started doing my business was that like I thought I had to buy 5,000 meter spools all the time. Right. And I would just do that and I would get enough for all of the heads, everything. Right. So how many of you actually will buy like thousand meter spools for custom colors? Okay. Uh, I I will say I did exactly that too. I was buying five thousand because it's like, well, I'm going to need it all until I realized, like in Wilcom and all the other software, it tells you how much that design is going to use of a spool in yards or meters. And if you know it's a thousand meters and it uses one yard, that's one thousand patches you can make. So I don't need to buy the five thousand meter one or whatever. Uh, so I've started buying the little guys. Yeah. Um, Especially, I I think that's where. <clears throat> If you're new to the embroidery world, you can look at it as you're, you want to build up your, your library of threads. And if it is something that is going to be used quite a bit, like it, maybe it's a, a darker shade of navy blue or something like that, where you know that you can possibly use it down the line. Yeah, you can make that decision of like, all right, I want this to kind of be a, a stop color that I carry. Yeah, maybe go ahead and, and, and get the larger cones of that thread. Something custom, like Jeff was saying, uh, an avocado green, and you know that it's you're not going to be doing thousands of pieces at a time, and you only have a single head. You get the smaller comb, um, and that's where these little things come into play. As far as when you're building your price list, um, you need to make decisions like: Will you special order thread? Is that a, a cost that you're going to incur, or are you going to charge a, a surcharge? I know some places actually make you buy the cone of thread if they know that you're not going to, they're not going to use it for any other job besides yours. There's different options where, uh, you know, surcharges, fees, uh, you know, custom fees, uh, even when it runs into digitizing. I know there's some places that will absorb the digitizing and not charge to the customer. Some charge just what they pay. So they break even. In my opinion, I think if you're selling to the public, you should, you know, it takes time for you to communicate with your digitizer, to email them, to order, to go back and forth with them. You should make a little money off that process as well. So I think you should charge more of what you're paying. Um, but there's when, when you're trying to establish uh, a price list, I think you really need to think ahead of time. Every single thing that you want to charge or you want to be compensated for, you should be up front with and have it on your price list. Um, I, I've seen embroiderers do things like there's a flat hooping charge, they, they call it. I think that's just basically saying just to get it on my machine and just to get into production, there's a minimum you have to meet. And from there, it goes higher depending on the, the project, the pro, you know, the stitch count, the quantity and whatnot. Um, but as, as far as there's been too many times where I think people have the, the basics as far as the pricing. And then they run into this and they're like, oh, I should have charged for that. And then they run into that and then I, I should have charged for that. Um, but 
<laughs> Sorry. Robots. Yeah, Robots. So the, the biggest thing is that there's so many different ways to do it. You know, I mean, there's not, there's no right or wrong way. It's what's right for you and how you operate. And I think that that's the biggest challenge is how do you, how do we figure out what system will work best for us and our needs? Yeah. And I agree, DJ, it's, it's a matter of trial and error though, because until you, well, like I said, I've been digitizing for years. And um, my business has evolved over that time where things have been uh, changed or fine. I went through four name progressions before I got the quick to stitch. Um, the same is going to happen with your pricing. You're going to start someplace and then you're going to realize, well, that just doesn't quite work. What if I did something different? And then right. you will come to the point where you're not only meeting and satisfying your financial need, but you're also meeting and and um, you're meeting and and supporting your customers' budgeting needs. They know they're not going to want to spend, let's see, um, a ten thousand stitch patch at at a dollar would be. God, and I'm terrible with the math because you know I've got brain issues here. But you know they're gonna want to be. They're not gonna want to spend twenty dollars on a patch that only fits the palm of your hand. Um, yeah. Unless there's something really, really special about that patch. But you know, they have their logo on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not twenty dollars worth of logo. Yeah. Um, if you if you're doing a one of, charge. Sky's the limit. Well, yeah. I agree, but you still want to be reasonable about it. Yeah, yeah. We we had to implement a, uh, a twenty dollar minimum invoice for people to come in and need like a name on something. All right, I'm not writing you an invoice for five dollars. I would sooner do it for free <laughs> than than charge you a five dollar invoice plus tax. It's not even worth my time to open the computer. So we we had to we had to fire up a twenty dollar minimum invoice. So if you you come in, you need one thing done. It starts at twenty bucks. It goes up from there. You bring in three things, and hey, you just might get those for the same twenty dollars. Um, right. so one patch. I mean, it's pretty Pass easy for one. pretty easy for one patch. If if someone really needs one patch. All right. Well, there's digitizing involved and everything else. Suddenly, that that thing's you know forty five bucks pretty quick. Yeah. And uh, right. that's really what you needed. Then, well, that's what you're gonna have to pay. Yeah. Um, so Nikki, Nikki runs a question. Do any of you have a price sheet for basic services, or do you quote out every job? So we'll start with you, Mike. So our price sheet is more or less private. Um, we we kind of quote every job. Um, a lot of times it's just pulled off of the price sheet, but it's, but it's all, it's all custom to the job because we, we look at the customer too. And, you know, there's, so kind of circling back to kind of some of the, some of the things we were just talking about, like, like color change fees and this fee and that fee, we're doing everything possible to not make our quotes and invoices look like a utility bill. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to see, Fee for this, fee for that, fee for this, fee for that. Why is it adjusting the price? Just tell me how much I'm paying and go away. Um, so we we just kind of lump all that into the one to the one price. So yeah, I'm going to my price sheet and I'm pulling my this many stitches, this many things off of my off of my matrix. But then there's you know, is this a guy I want to see again? Is this, uh, you know, is this a guy who is going to bring me a lot of work that I don't have to put a lot of effort into, into doing so maybe he gets, you know, closer to kind of contractor pricing. Maybe, maybe this is somebody who just insists on bringing in their own, own clothes and stuff. So, okay, well, you're, you're paying full pop retail for, for customer supplied gear, even if you are a contractor, I don't, I don't care because I, I need to make money on the clothes too. Um, colors and stuff. We don't, yeah. It, when, when we first got started, our first machine came with a box full of good old thread. 
And I'm kind of glad it did because the good old poly color chart is 300 colors. Uh, that's it. I don't even, I haven't even counted how many are on the Madeira chart. And so I'm more than willing to, to wave that good old chart in front of people's faces. Go, you pick your color. Cause a, I get, I get them the color they want and they can't argue it because they picked it out. And I'm more than happy to bring that, bring that Kona thread in with the, for no extra charge, because that's how, that's how I'm basing, you know, that, that part of the business is this is the ones you get to pick from no more. But if I don't happen to have, I think I'm up to 110 of them now out of 300. So, but no, nobody wants, you know, buying a, buying a hat. They, they want to know how much is the hat. They don't, right. they don't even care how much the stitching versus the blank hat is. This is one of how much am I paying for the thing? So there's, yeah, I think there's too many, just, just to, if you're, especially if you're dealing with, with a lot of retail orders, there's too many factors involved just to say, this is how much it is for a hat. Mm -hmm. This is how much it is for a shirt. You know, not only the garment, you can't just say hat. Is it a flex fit? Is mm -hmm. it a, is it a cheapy adjustable hat that you, you know, that's a promo quality hat? You know, is it a Richardson hat? There's so many factors. And like like Mike said, when someone walks in, I think they, it's like, I need 12 hats. What's the total? And they may say, what's that breakdown per hat? Um, at the only time that, that I've seen in my experience that you need a set price list that you're actually giving to somebody is if you do offer contract work, they're going to be quoting off your fees. And I'm sure they're not going to want to go to you every single time they're quoting a job. And not only are you not going to want them to come to you every time they're quoting a job and you have to quote, um, but setting up a, a contract price list to say quantity, stitch count, bare minimum, this is what you get, this is what you pay. And then that way they can base their pricing off of that. Yeah. I'm actually starting to migrate a lot of my regular customers over to their own little private e-commerce store. Mm -hmm. It's only password accessible, so only they can get in. And uh, and then go in and just anytime we make something for them, we go ahead and throw it throw it on their web store, and then they can go in and reorder. And then once a year, I'll, I mean, we haven't been doing it long enough to have to have gone through this yet. But my plan is once a year to go in there and reevaluate pricing on everything and and re up it and. If suddenly sales stop on one product because it went from 18 to 22 or whatever the whatever the case may be then then that's then that's what happened but I, mean, honestly, uh, I can say i have products that i flat fee so if somebody comes to me and they say i want a baby announcement on a corner of a blanket or a baby announcement on one of those cubbies right like i have a flat fee for that because while the stitch count is going to vary, the colors are going to vary slightly. I yeah. know what it cost. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that way I can fire that off quick. But for everything else, like I have them send me their logo. If they want their logo on a hat, they're sending me their logo. I'm getting an estimated yeah. stitch count. I'm going to know how many, how much it's going to run on my machine. Because then once I have, once I know exactly how much, how much time that's going to take, now I can use my sliding scale to determine what their price is going to be. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. Let me ask everybody this. This is kind of a question that got sparked into this subject matter today from one of our one of our friends here. Um, where do you consider where you're going to offer wholesale pricing? If someone comes to you and says, well, I'm reselling these, a.k.a. all the clothing lines out there that are going to bring you millions of dollars when they hit it big. Um, but w when do you consider a customer where you're going to give them wholesale pricing? For me, it's retail location, established garment sales in their past history, wholesale certificate. So, okay. So it is someone in the industry reselling garments, not just someone in business, correct? If it's so like, I'm going to throw my jujitsu gym out there. My jujitsu gym has, um, hats that they put in their display cases they sell they get wholesale because mm -hmm. they already sell apparel with their logo on it that's them trying to make a buck off of their their garments right um but let's say you know i have a construction company come to me and they're like i need 25 hats with my logo on it i've got 25 guys well yeah they have a wholesale certificate but they're the end user mm -hmm. 
So for me, when it comes down to it, it comes down to if they have an established retail location or an established store where they're selling those products, that's when I start looking at dropping them to, to wholesale pricing. Because I've, I've had it bit, bite me before where I've given wholesale pricing to the wrong person and then, then, and then you're stuck at that. Right. So that yeah. for me, that's where it is, is I, I want to make sure that yes, they are a business. Yes, they're selling their merchandise. Now I'm looking at, at doing that versus I'm making 25 less chest, left chest designs for their employees to wear. I always wish that I got to sell to the retail. I did contract only on everything. It was all volume. And well, let me ask you this, DJ. Day, if if you were if you were strictly contract, who were your customers? Ad agencies, um, you know, people selling to schools. Um, mm -hmm. I did a lot for schools, um, but I I used to be a teacher, so like I loved doing like the school stuff, right? So um, I would give them all sorts of ideas and stuff, but um, a lot of ad agencies, and then a lot of companies that did screen printing. So I did a lot for screen printers, you know, like where they didn't want to send their customer somewhere else, you know, and then run that risk of them doing the screen printing as well, you know, like later. And so um, I was in Houston, Texas, right? So there was like huge, huge um, embroidery operations there and screen printing operations. So, you know, 200 head, you know, that kind of stuff. And, um, but like screen printers did the screen printing embroiderers did the embroidery and they all kind of worked together. And um, I did all the specialty stuff. I don't know how I got into that, but I was the specialty <laughs> guy. I did the custom appliques and, you know, like tackle twill and um, direct to garment printing, right? I was the third person to own brother direct garment printer the first trade show it was at and so oh, wow. i got into that really quick and man i i paid that off within nine months it was wow. awesome you know but there was a lot of large shops right that did screen printing they didn't want to touch the 36 and under shirts you know for screen printing or even 100 if it was like a lot of colors mm. so, right so I saw a question here that popped up that I want to answer. So Andre asked, so you go through the process of having to research all that. And that popped up when I was saying, basically, if they had a retail location, all of that, generally you don't have to. When they're coming to you, you don't have to research them. If you do have to research them, it's probably a candidate that's not going to get wholesale pricing. Um, but other than that, it's a, it's a quick Google search and everybody that I have had that needs to be on wholesale pricing or contract pricing has come to me and asked me for wholesale pricing and contract pricing. Um, generally, if it's a coffee shop that's going to just throw their logo on their stuff and they're going to wear it for their employees, they don't ask you for contract. Yeah. It's people that are going to be reselling that they really want to know, okay, well, what's the contract price? Because they want to be able to set their retail based off of that. Or the fundraisers. Or the oh. fundraisers. Yeah. yeah, I do a lot of I do a lot of production for um, fundraisers, and obviously they get my of my of my pricing scale for production. I have two. I have I have, you know, the ones that are going to resell and the ones that are going to be the end users, um, and it's in my conversation with these people that you know they may come right out and say we're doing a fundraiser and, and i need you know 50 hats or we're doing a fundraiser and i need you know 200 shirts um so i didn't even have to ask i know they're doing a fundraiser so i know that i'm going to use that one tier that the um the lower tier if they come in and they say i need this one patch i'm i'm going to sell it to my buddy across the street he's not going to get that that specialty pricing he's going to get full retail he wants to sell it to his buddy across the street. That's fine, but he's going to pay me for my time, full price for my time. So, you know, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to make sure that you're making a profit. Yeah, right. And your Most machine of the can run for so many, so many hours a day, and yeah. so that machine run has to pay for your entire day. But Mike, you're going to say something. 
yeah, mo most of the customers that, that come to us, you can tell within the first two, three minutes of the conversation what you're dealing with. Um, I haven't met anybody who's ordered 24 hats for themselves. Um, you know, if they're ordering a, a couple boxes of hats, they, you can probably bank on them wanting to resell them or even just giving them away as promo items. So the majority of our work is priced assuming that these people are either giving them away at a loss or they're marking them up a little bit to, uh, to, to, uh, it's an advertising expense is basically what it boils down to for them. So most of our, like our, we, I've got four different matrices on my, on my price matrix. So, you know, contract patches, uh, retail, and, Okay. Okay. All right. Pizza's in later. Okay. Go on upstairs. Daddy's on the phone. <laughs> Sorry. She's a cutie. Um, that's that's Davida. Um, 90 percent of our work goes on the one on the one matrix. It uh, we just assume people are either giving away or or. Or not. If someone comes in and orders one thing, they're immediately paying thirty percent higher. They get they get the same price matrix as the the people that bring in their own garments. Um, just to keep it simple. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I haven't used my actual like discounted contract matrix in a little over a year. Uh, I kind of kind of started trying to weed those guys out because they're the contract business is never as easy as they want to make it seem to be. Um, they're like, oh, we're just going to provide all the garments. Uh, all we need you to do is stitch and blah, 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 blah. But nope, next thing you know, you're getting drop shipped from SNS. You got to count all their stuff in. You got to make sure it's all right. You're managing their order. And it's not just stitching. It's not just throwing a logo on it. It's, <clears throat> it's way more work than it turns out to be. So that that deeper discount for those those you know contract people is more or less gone away in our business because you want me to do all that crap then you're paying for it if you just want to ship me a box i stitch what's in there and send it back out i'm not counting it i'm not thinking about it you know with the exception of having a total quantity because you kind of need that to do the billing on if it's anything more than that then you're not just a contract customer anymore so right so all right so yeah let me throw this question and i'm going to throw it at dj because i feel like he needs to answer this one <laughs> totally not on the spot so why would you if somebody wanted to base on stitch count why would you not base on stitch count or why would you base on stitch count i well, think you already answered that the but but there's a good there's a good way to look at it too though like um if, if any of you have done like a design for like a school that would be like like um oak ridge high school the blah 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 right there's a lot of text there's a lot of letters in that um i find that a lot of people when they're doing it um, doing designs like that, especially if they don't have a lot of head, like just one head of embroidery equipment, they'll have the machine trim between each letter because they don't want to take the time to like maybe clip some stitches or something like that. And they don't, what you don't realize is how much longer that stitch out takes. And I, I did an example on some of the education stuff I do. I took the same design and I had the machine trim and then I, I trimmed after and it was based on like 36 shirts. The difference on those 36 shirts was like four hours of stitch time. Wow. You mean the machine took four hours longer than you, than you actually trimming it? Yes. And so, so basically, now I have a question. Basically the same stitch count. Same identical stitch count. Um, basically, the only thing was the um, lock stitches, right? Um, a couple a couple more lock stitches, but the same, everything else was the same pretty much. It was like within a couple stitches. But you reduce or you take those trims out. Now, all of a sudden, you're you're doing those 36 shirts so much faster than what you actually think. It, it is pretty amazing 
people don't think that it takes that long to execute a trim, but it slows down before it, it, it moves. And then it, it takes time to build back up. And if you do that over and over again, it just keeps compiling. Right. So it, you know, that's like kind of one of those things like, so you can't just go off a stitch count alone because what if that's just a solid fill and you're not like, maybe it's only two or three and the machine's just going the whole time. That's going to stitch out fast. But if you're doing all these color changes and you're doing all these trims, now all of a sudden that 5,000 stitch design takes the equivalent of a 10,000 stitch design. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, only like, paying, they're only paying for the five. They're only paying for the five. It's same thing with digitizing. Sometimes the designs that look so simple are the ones that take the longest. Yep. Not based yeah. And, and, and that, and that leads, leads to the argument of, you know, everybody looks at the bottom line for digitizing. It's like, oh, I can get it cheaper elsewhere. All right. But that, that one design that you saved five, ten dollars once on, did they program it in a way where every time it's on the machine, it's running the most efficient way that it can? Yep. Or are they just are they just trying to get these designs out because it's cheap, this five dollar one hour uh, routine that they, they get overseas. But you know, I think everybody here that digitizes, whether for the for themselves or for a customer, they've got that production minded view of the design of this is what's it's it's that balance of what's going to run best of what the way it's going to look as far as registration and whatnot on the hat and what's going to cut down on the time that it's going to be on the machine does it need a trim do you need a color change or can you combine colors you know within the same color change these are things that you get from that 10 to 15 dollar more design that you pay once that every time it's on that machine it's going to save you money every single time yeah and that's where, like to DJ's point there, where what you're charging for isn't necessarily what's actually going into it. That circles back to what I was suggesting about about perceived value, because I can charge four times more for a really, really nice applique design that takes 10% the stitches, the same thing in, in fill stitch did. Right. I can right. be I can be done a run of sweaters in, in a day that would take me a week if it was all fill sweat fill stitch. By by doing it in applique, charge way more, and and have a way nicer dinner that night. Like it's, it's right. you know it's it's hard to price just based on machine time uh, or stitch count. Uh, you know, extended to machine time is one thing, but uh, you get you got to draw that line in the sand somewhere. And I think that's the that's the part that's the struggle that most shops run into. I certainly did, is how how much math do I want to do? Um, that's really it. I got it. I got to stop working on my pricing and start charging my pricing. Mm -hmm. Like like it just gotta just gotta just gotta quit. You know, you, you hit analysis paralysis really fast if you start getting way into the weeds. Like how much per color change and how much i'm not saying that all that stuff isn't real money isn't real costs but man how you got you, you gotta you gotta find that average there's too many micro things that can happen that oh, you yeah. feel like like mike is sitting there if i can sit there and look at a design look at the garment look at what operator is going to be running it i can sit there and say this is going to be a factor. This is going to be a factor. This is going to be a factor. And like Mike said, I'm going to be sitting there, you know, carry the one. Yeah. It, yeah. There's just too many things there. There, there has to be law of averages when it comes to, to some things. Yeah. So, you know, one of the, one of the good questions would be like, you know, there are a lot of different ways of doing it. So how valuable is it to everyone to have a guide, like a, a like something that actually kind of says, you know, if you want to price this way or that way and help you kind of determine it, because I do think that it's important that you figure out what you need to make on that machine, right? Like what is going to cover all of the costs? It doesn't necessarily matter which way you come to that conclusion, but you need to come to that conclusion. And the thing is, it's going to come down to how many embroidery heads you have. 
you know, you can't just price everything based on everybody else because you can only produce so much in an hour, but you need to know how much. And that's like kind of where the design, getting a quality design, deciding not to have the machine trim all the time, making sure that that machine, that needle is going up and down as much as possible. That's the efficiency side of things. The more efficient that is based on your pricing, the more money you'll make. Yeah. Right. But it goes um, hand in hand. Yeah. So we we have a we have a really loose target of forty five dollars an hour per head. Is is what we was what we shoot for 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 our, our for charging out, not counting the garments and, and whatnot, but the actual like value add. Um forty forty five bucks an hour per head. Then on, on the twelfth head, that's five hundred and forty bucks an hour. So if we can if we can be pumping stuff through there fast enough, we make all of our margin back in the back end in improving efficiencies and improving workflow and investing in equipment and infrastructure to make our work go faster. Because, you know, like, like we were all talking about before, the customer doesn't care if we got one head, 12 heads, doesn't care if we got an eye line or a laser. They, they, don't, they don't care what I owe they just want to know, you know, how how quick and how much they're going to pay for their for their one thing. So, I need to be able to charge a reasonable amount of money for that product, and then I'm fortunate enough I can be able to back it up into, you know, I can do this better because I bought this, or I can do this better because I got that, or I'm not going to buy this because I'm not going to do enough of this to justify that piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So, right. it's that's that's where we try to make all our all of our improvements is on the process and the back end because once once that gets to the point where it's as as good as it's going to get uh, in our you know current environment you know until we move buildings or or get newer machines or something I mean like our our old our old ass twelve heads are stuck at six hundred stitches per minute whether we like it or not. Hmm. And I use you know as as primarily a digitizer I use a flat fee schedule so that my client can quote their customers mm -hmm. what the digitizing fee is without having to say, but I got to find out what the stitch count is first. Um, whatever they do beyond the, the digitizing fee, that's their pricing matrix. Yeah. But I want to make sure that they understand that, you know, it's real simple. X dollars, $25 for a six color design. $40 for a seven to 12 color design. And then, you know, from there, but so that they can go to their customer and tell them you're going to have to have this digitized. It's going to cost you X. And there's, you know, some, um, I use the, I use the color count just again to make it simple for my clients and some of them, you know, the, the design will be so simple that, you know, I make I make extra on that because it's only a fifteen minute um, fifteen minute digitizer. But then on the on the other side, I'll have a six color design that might take me two hours. So I just feel that they just work themselves out over you know over a long period. And as long as my numbers are still good, and as long as I can meet my budget, as long as I can pay my bills, I'm fine. All right. Well, we are four minutes into overtime. It's not bonus time till it's fifteen minutes over. Uh, but we're definitely we'll in there. overtime. But there's so um, many things to discuss. Yep. There's so many things to discuss that we're actually. Well, high five, uh, Justin. High five. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> is, that, is that what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> let's let's move this into a part two, and we'll actually discuss it more uh, next week. And so we're gonna run through. We will run through the comments of today's live and we'll grab all the questions that we've missed and we'll pull those up and uh, we'll go over them in part two. Um, and then that way you guys can get a better understanding because ultimately my pricing is different than Justin and it's different than Ramona and Matt's is different than mine. And yeah. it, it all comes down and Mike's is definitely different because it all comes down to your currency exchange, your location, your yeah. market. And We're 72 cents per thousand stitches. That, that's just, that's what it is. 72 cents. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Michael Downey and 
Ramona McKee for joining us in today's live. Um, it was Happy great having you guys. Day. And if you guys want to swing in next week for part two, we'd love it as well. Um, but I'll go ahead and close this out. Uh, unless if anybody, anybody have any closing comments before we go? I just wanted to say uh, thanks for inviting me into the, into the herd. Um, in the short week that I've been uh, involved at a deeper level, I've gotten a little, a little better look under the hood. And I just want to say to everybody watch that you guys have no idea how much extra work and thought is going on behind the curtain here from, uh, from these, from these people. The, mm -hmm. There's, there's plans for things going so far out and, uh, and just a lot of exciting stuff. And uh, even I had no idea. And I thought I was tight with these guys. So, <laughs> uh, There's still secrets. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. I would imagine. Um, so just, uh, you know, stay tuned. Tell your friends. Uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on behind the scenes. Uh, and as it rolls out, it's going to be it's going to be an exciting, exciting bunch to be a part of. And again, thank you guys for um, uh, bringing me in, for um, uh, asking me to be um, uh, sorry, moderator. Thank you in the group. Um, I feel that that's a, a, a position of honor. And for all of those watching that are not part of the, the um, embroidery nude group, you have to answer all three questions. All three four. questions. Uh, four, four questions. Excuse me. You have to answer yeah, all Yeah, because one question is a two-parter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You can't just say yes to everything. It doesn't work. All right. That's what I got. All right. All right. Well, uh, with that, I'll start below me. This is like the Partridge family. Uh, we have DJ Adams from <laughs> Digitizing Masterclass. We have Ramona McKee from Quick to Stitch. Matt Enderly from Patch Phrase. We have Mr. Mike Muldowney, Nerd in the North. Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. And I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. We'd like to thank you guys for hanging out with us, and we will continue this next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.